So as a part of studying community ecology, we're looking at how those the organisms of different species within a community interact with one another. Uh, and one of the, the last things we talked about in the, the previous lecture was uh, competitive exclusion. Uh, and I talked about how some birds, say for example, might occupy different levels of a tree uh, to feed off the same tree without actually competing with one another because they are displacing one another. Uh, another way uh, that that could be dealt with, which I didn't say in the last lecture, but I'd uh, start off with here, uh, is with time of day as well. So that was like a spatial um, way of displacement, but they can uh, displace each other somewhat in time, but still carry on the same role. So for example, uh, owls may hunt small mammals and hawks may hunt to eat small mammals in the same general habitat. But the owls are nocturnal hunting at night, whereas the hawks are diurnal hunting at day. So uh, same basic role, same basic niche within the community, it, but they're displaced by their behavior uh, and, and when they are actually uh, out feeding. So that's another just example of how that can occur. So what we want to look at now is how some characters within organisms, because of this type of competition, may be displaced. So organisms are now competing with one another in the same habitat for the same resources. And this is kind of, again, coming back say, to the, the beginning of the course where we talked about natural selection, uh, that there's genetic diversity within a population, that then certain pressures may select for one feature or another within that diverse group of individuals. So uh, all these different individuals of the same species are not exactly the same. Some of them are taller, some of them are shorter, some of them have a bigger beak, some of them have a shorter beak. One feature isn't better than the other, it's just that for particular behavior, for a particular adaptation, one may work out better and then be selected for. So an example of that, coming back all the way to, uh, again, we talked about Darwin's finches, the finches on the Galapagos Islands, uh, or also called just the Galapagos finches. Here's another example of character displacement. In this particular study that, that was performed, we have these three species of finch. So they're all the same genus, uh, Geospiza, uh, and then we have G. Uh, fuliginosa, G. fortis, and G. magnorostris. Okay, so when fuliginosa is all by itself uh, and no none of the other finches are around, it has this smaller beak size. So we're looking here at, at beak size, beak depth. Okay, small, medium, large. They're going to line up like this. Uh, and the percent of the individual sampled and where their beaks landed up. So they're pretty much all the ones sampled are in the small beak range here. G. fortis, when they're on a different island all by themselves, the other finches aren't present on that particular island, and their beaks are measured, their beaks are in the smaller size range as well. So they're very similar to the same depth as, as the fuliginosa. But on a third island where all three species live together, what we find is that the Magnorostris has these really large beaks, so they're, they're very large here. The Fuliginosa has the small beak, and it still they're small beaked. But what we find is this shift. All right, the displacement, so that's the character displacement. The G. fortis, now on this island, their beaks are larger. They have a larger beak. Same species, but it consistently measuring the beak, they're statistic, statistically significant in the difference in their size. Right? So a certain character of that particular species has been displaced. So there was favored, the larger individual, the individuals with the larger beaks were favored, and they adapted then to that particular environment because of competition. Without competition, they then tend to have then a smaller beak, but with competition, their beaks are larger. And that's the type of thing that we were talking about early in the course, that that doesn't make them a new species. They're both uh, geospiza forts. But um, over time, that could lead to speciation. So that's kind of, so it's the competition we talked about again at the beginning of the course uh, with the genetics aspect of it that underlies this, but, but now looking at from the ecological aspect of it, this is what kind of drives that, those selection processes, looking at those specific features. 
Something else we're going to uh, talk about here, just in terms of um, interactions, again, between organisms and other, other types of interactions uh, between organisms you know, include those predator-prey relationships. Right? And, and because of them, while they're in the same habitat, the prey organisms then may, over time, also become adapted uh, to protect themselves from being preyed upon. So, for example, um, if you have a, you know, a tree and you have a, an animal that lives on the tree bark, say this uh, is a butterfly, okay, here, it's not a good butterfly, I'm just doing it like this. Uh, a predator, so one of the birds that might eat butterflies, can easily take it right off that tree because it can see it. it. It's very outstanding in terms of its color, uh, that it's different. However, what we can find sometimes, well, that's a really, sometimes my colors don't uh, seem to work really well, um, is some adaptations, you know, where maybe the same species, you know, of insect over time is select has selection occur and their color then tends to blend in with the tree that they are settling on so now the predator can't really see them as well so we end up with camouflage being selected for in prey organisms right and so that is something that does happen within communities because of these types of interactions in addition to that uh, we see what we call mimicry, which is where, let's say, for example, this species of butterfly, uh, it is highly visible, but maybe it's noxious or toxic. So uh, a bird eats it and it becomes ill and, and becomes sick and vomits it up. So now the next time the bird sees that, it's not going to want to eat it. The individual that it ate is dead, but it, it's helping preserve the other members of that species. So the coloration, actually the bright coloration is in this case a, a warning coloration. Saying, don't eat me because I taste bad or I'll make you ill if you consume me. What can happen then are other species who have some variation in their color may be avoided uh, if they have a similar color. So they tend to look like or mimic these individuals who are toxic. And even though they're, the other species is not toxic, they'd be avoided by the predator. So some organisms tend to then look like other organisms who have a defense. Uh, and they don't have really a defense themselves. Their defense in a way is again, it's a, a type of camouflage. Instead of just blending in with the background, they are kind of blending in with another species who then is protected. Again, they're not thinking about this or trying to do it. It's just a matter of the selection of the organisms, whether they're seen by the predators or not seen by the predators, avoided by the predators or consumed by the predators. And then over time and generations, they tend to favor one characteristic you know, or another. So we tend to see this type of thing, coloration and patterns uh, within organisms then changing to adapt because of predation pressure. Other types of interactions, and some people really call, uh, is this related to, to predation, uh, are different types of symbiosis. So symbiosis is where you have, you know, two species living together in, or in close association, we'll put, for a long time. Sometime. Now, what is the association? This is where we have these uh, three uh, categories here. Parasitism, commensalism, and mutualism. So in parasitism, we have one benefits, one is harmed. So the parasite benefits from the relationship the host, is what we call them, is usually harmed. Now, typically, unlike predation, the parasite's objective usually isn't to kill the organism and consume it. It is to live with the organism and feed off it. As long as that organism continues to be alive, it can keep feeding off it. If the organism dies, then 
it loses its food source and it will die. So the intention is not necessarily to kill the host organism, um, but it is harming it, it is taking from it, and the host organism gets no benefit from this whatsoever. We have commensalism. And in commensalism, we have one organism benefits. And one organism, their relationship is, is neutral. Right? So they aren't really harmed by the presence of the other organism. Uh, they don't really benefit from the presence of the other organism. Uh, so there's two organisms living together. One is living on the other or off the other one. Um, but the one who is now in this case, the host organism isn't really harmed in any particular way. And then we have mutualism where both benefit. So this is what we see say with, you know, the algae, the symbiotic algae that live in corals, right? The algae benefits from being protected with inside the coral. It gets certain nutrients from the coral. The coral then gets nutrients from the photosynthesis of the algae. The coral requires the algae. The algae requires the coral. And it is a mutualistic beneficial relationship for both organisms, right? So they're living together in a coral reef community. Uh, one is an algae, a, a single-celled protist. The other is an animal, a cnidarian. And, but they're living together in a mutualistic symbiosis. That's kind of the idea. And there's a whole variety of these, these sorts of things. The lichen, you know, which we talked about is, a, again, algae and a fungi. Actually, it's two different types of fungi, uh, we said. Um, two different types of fungi plus an algae, all living together, all kind of uh, interacting and then benefiting one another in a mutualistic way. Right, so we have those types of interactions. Lastly, last thing I'm going to talk about here. So those are just definition based. You just really need to know, you know, what what each of them mean, uh, and they're pretty um, straightforward. I'm going to erase this just so it doesn't overlap with what we're going to talk about here. The last thing we'll talk about is the formation of a community. So when when a new community is formed, so what do you mean? How would I mean new community? Because the Earth has been here for a long time. Well, certain environments become destroyed. So a volcano erupts and it kills everything all right, for miles around. Right? And so now there's a burned, charred forest covered in volcanic ash and there's nothing really alive in that area. What will happen is that over time, we have a process called succession. Certain organisms called pioneer species. So this is now a sort of a timeline that we're looking at. It's not just something, you know, growing up. It's that this is, these are all different, say, species of organisms. And in a particular habitat that is open, where anything can come into it, maybe it's not ready. The soil isn't ready the pH of the soil is different and certain organisms can't really inhabit it. So, but other organisms can. Those organisms are the pioneer species. They're the first ones into this new open habitat uh, and they start to thrive. So in this particular example, these are some grasses. And the grasses maybe have um, bacteria associated with their roots, the nitrogen fixing bacteria. So they're actually starting to cycle nutrients and put different nutrients and nitrogen uh, into the soil. And so now other plants can start to grow. Maybe because of uh, microbial activity, the pH of the soil might start to change as well and you get new species. Now, what you often see again with plants in, in this particular case is sort of like my drawing, size you know, as well. So closer to the ground, organisms are the often early pioneer species and then they start to get taller partly because they're gonna be competing for light. So uh, taller organisms coming in first, if that were the case, would create shade and then you wouldn't really have other organisms, which would also then decrease the overall diversity within the community because others wouldn't have a chance really to come in and get settled. So what we usually see is that some of these smaller organisms come in first. They would have insects associated with them and then some, uh, some animals that might feed off the vegetation. Uh, then you get some small, some shrubs coming in. Then you start to get some small trees and then some you know, a little bit larger trees until we get you know some very large 
trees growing in over a longer period of time. Some of the smaller plants would be called understory plants. They're living underneath the, the canopy of these. They may become shaded out and then die off, and so the community will then change. Um, uh, and, and that will eventually reach sort of a, a point where we have reached sort of the maximum kind of diversity for that community, uh, and we call it a climax community. So it's the community of organisms that uh, is the result of the progression of different species starting to inhabit a new environment. So starting off with the pioneers and then leading up to the climax species who only come in toward the end, uh, but then tend to dominate for a very long period of time. This also then becomes you know, a very stable community uh, for a very long time until something happens, that uh, a disaster of some sort that changes it, you know, a fire or something um, that alters the species composition and then uh, allows a place for new organisms you know, to come into the environment. That's also partly what's going to affect um, a little bit of the evolutionary process we talked about with uh, island biogeography in the beginning. So like founder species coming onto an island, they might be genetically different than others. And so this, these are the types of things also that can uh, affect diversity within a species and promote uh, speciation as well. But in this case, we're just looking at it as just how a community is built. It's usually slowly over time with different species uh, inhabiting it based on the current conditions. And then as the conditions change, new new species tend to inhabit the area. All right, and that's that's the kind of the end of what we're gonna cover with this. It's all the main terminology um, and some of the, the basic concepts for community ecology.